Yeah. And I'm and, and just discussing this earlier with you is um, the whole idea that today we are so overwhelmed by daily media. And I really imagine at any given time, people across the world on any uh, particular day could very well be having the same conversation. And that's a very frightening idea that whatever the latest breaking news is and whatever the latest news event is captures people's imagination. And there's, I almost feel, and I felt that at a certain time, I used to live in the US and I came back to live in Pakistan um, in 2003. And for a long period, I started noticing the nature of the conversations that would happen. And there was a flatness to them which was taken um, over by news, in the presence of news in our lives. And, uh, and I, I realized that a lot of art had also become responsive at a daily level to that news. And there was a slight problem with that because with that kind of uh, removal of oneself from that immediate point of immediate event and time, um, there was a need to let layers settle and to take some kind of distance. And coming from Pakistan, there is always this question asked about you know, whether it's fundamentalism or uh, you know, the status of women, which are very, very favorite topics and uh, people outside. Um, I think it's a, it's a difficult because, of course, it's a politically, a place like Pakistan is politically very charged and we're all engaged in it, in it uh, mentally and emotionally at all levels. But when exactly do you turn it into, what, what is the time needed to reflect on it and turn it into something which is not uh, sort of a reactive statement? Because you're getting reactive statements in different forms in newspapers every day. So I think there's, for me personally, there's a desire for some level of distancing. Um, and, and joyous about uh, sort of getting a bunch of different political um, or any kind of sort of understanding of the world around me located in a story that happens over time in history and develops in my own mind over time that it isn't happening in Egypt. Um, and I was just giving these guys an interesting example of the way a lot of art and politics is approached in the academy and because there is a certain trend also to that if you're intelligent means that you must be ironic and you must make a political statement. So that's somehow become the only gauge of intelligence. An ironic, ironic political statement. An ironic political statement versus a sort of humor of another kind. Um, uh, and I went to, I was teaching in the National College of Arts in Lahore and I went for a jury of the undergraduate students. And this girl, you know, showed me a portfolio and she said, yeah, this is my, uh, you know, globalization uh, um, painting. This is my feminist <laughs> painting. This is my that painting. This is my painting. So I just turned around and said, so where's your work? And, uh, and I think that that's a very naked sort of thing of somehow, uh, also the assumption that if you have, if you look at the work in the world in a slightly critical manner, that you would be interested in every aspect of politics all over the world, which you might not be. So I think these are the, uh, some of the limitations and I feel there are present challenges that a lot of people feel and, uh, and also some sort of cliches of what art and politics are. Uh, At the same time, I want to just interject and say that um, we have to be careful that our framing doesn't lead us to think that politically, uh, political art of any form, however we define that term, is the dominant norm in the visual arts. The dominant norm is still not that at all. I think we occupy spaces where yeah, we've seen a lot of work this is very much that deals yeah, yeah. for yes. better or for worse with documentary practices, with historical events, with research, with archive. And so it makes us think and also talk as if About that's this, the dominant yeah. Then I, I still look at you know the Prize <coughs> winner or whatever else, and all of it is still you know highly abstracted um, aesthetic work. Um, and I'm saying this without any value judgment that isn't connected necessarily to uh, a certain kind of research. And I'm not saying the work that's based on research is better or worse, I'm just saying that this is actually still a very fractional portion of all the work that's going to be. Sure. Uh, and it can be a little deceiving to sit in like, yes. this show with the title Freedom is Notional and think, yeah. oh my god, the political art is taking over uh, uh, the visual art space. And I had an argument um, uh, with this artist in New York who I collaborate with sometimes, uh, Mary Wally Blackburn, and you know, she was talking about certain questions of measurability um, as it comes out of political work and after a while she was talking I said, but wait a second, you know that when you walk into any museum show, nine out of ten work won't be like this. Um, and we mistake to think of our peer group as somehow representing some sort of massive 
Uber trend, which is not, that's just the one thing I wanted to say. Um, and, and, but the example you're giving or that we experienced is one very specific sub yeah. um, sort of trend. Um, and then what I wanted to do is uh, come back to some of the things that all three of us talked about, uh, these three things that I wrote down. One is the issue of legibility and legibility within the world. Uh, one is the seclusion that this space operates within, both in terms of what audiences come and also how the gallery is considered within the public discourse. Um, and then the third, something that I think about often, is the impact, however you might measure impact, or you might choose not to. Um, and one of the things that uh, I've been struck by is that projects I have done uh, where I've thought that there will be some sort of reaction, including some sort of censor, or some sort of, in broad terms, hung up. None of that happened. And so then you start thinking, okay, so was the work so cleverly cloaked that the hidden message was only visible to this select portion of the audience and the <coughs> censors didn't get it? Um, I'm thinking specifically of some work I had done about the military government while we had a military government in Bangladesh 2007, 2008. So is it that? Is it that it was so cloaked that they didn't get it? Um, and if so, what does it say about the audience? And was there something to get? Or is it that that space just isn't threatening to them. Because I certainly noted that at the same time, the uh, CNN stringer, uh, who wrote one cover story about the link to this kind of uh, political movement and funding linked to uh, military intelligence, immediately got arrested. Because he was considered a high value target. You know, Even though he's linked with CNN, so theoretically has the same sort of protection as, let's say, a practitioner in a certain kind of international art practice would have, they still went after him because he was considered um, a threat, and the work in the gallery was not. And so then it starts making me think about, well, what's the impact? And um, we had this debate about um, impact specifically in the context of some um, lawyers that I work with. And I said, OK, I look at these lawyers, and I really envy, in some ways, their clarity of purpose, because they're working with a case, and either the case is won or lost. It's very clear. And what's my clarity? And then, of course, the response is that you're not supposed to be looking for clarity. And the question of use value itself is incredibly loaded. But I just want to throw this out there, because these are issues that I struggle with sometimes. And sometimes I think, OK, that was very interesting. How many people did that conversation touch? And I think if you are engaging in some sort of speaking back to state power, uh, you know, you question uh, how much impact I think if they're not reacting. That means you're relegated into the space of Acha, this will happen. And of course, there are breakthroughs like the uh, Pakistan show where that um, pretty absurd painting, uh, the Benazir on King Musharraf's lap, was smashed. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. But those incidents are so rare yeah. that I think also the visual arts world just sort of reacts with, you know, I mean, we even use the word elation maybe that this happened. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. It actually moved people or not to antagonize people, but most of the time it doesn't happen. But I think, I think also that again, it's like, uh, in, again in the context of Pakistan, I mean, this journalist was talking to me the other day and she said, so So it must be really hard to, for all these artists to be making art. What is this thing about, you know, how much freedom is there to do the kind of work that you do? And I said that I felt that there's absolute freedom. I'm actually not in the line of fire at all and I'm in a very, very comfortable position. And um, so it is, I think, it, I know, it is a sort of a limited, Space it impacts people who are interested in writing, and there's a there's a circle, circle, circle of people who come around. But I'm definitely I don't think any one of us are really um, uh, not in life-threatening positions. Which is interestingly, there are lots of artists who, for instance, in Pakistan in uh, Zia's time, uh, who actually live on the whole uh, reputation of having. Um, I mean, considering that poets were the ones who were being sent to the jails, it's also visual artists who sort of climbed onto the bandwagon and celebrate having been, uh, had a really tough time. And actually, they didn't have a very tough time. And I think that there's, there's something to be said about you know, just being straightforward, that you can be, uh, you're doing what you're doing, it's effectual or important in, in a particular kind of way. But I think it's uh, sort of a bit uh, dishonest to put yourself in that spotlight of uh, how important it is in that particular manner. But for instance, my experience with showing this video reserved in Lahore, um, was it two, two years later, I saw everyone started sending me a music video. This was during uh, Zian's, uh, during um, the Chief Justice sort of celebration when he got reinstated and things and uh, in Pakistan. And a song was, uh, a, sort of there was, a poem of phases that was set to a tune by this uh, band. 
and they actually used a traffic jam. They ripped off pieces from this, not literally, but restaged the.